Hi, my name is Betsy Trussell, and I'm here in Provo, Utah for a great event. Um, my oldest daughter is getting married, and we had the opportunity to come and make these lifey videos. I'm excited about doing this, and I'm going to start out um, by telling you that today is March 29th, 2017, and I'm kind of nervous about this, but it's just going to be for family and posterity, and I think it's a worthwhile project. I grew up in um, Terre Haute, Indiana, which is a moderately sized city, um, and we were city folks. I was born on a cold winter night in January. I was the sixth of seven children born to Mary Frances Hanley and James William Slusser the first. My um, siblings all doted on me. I was kind of a spoiled little kid, and um, I felt like I was loved for ev by everyone, by absolutely everyone. One of the things that I just recently realized was that um, I was a rainbow baby. I, I hadn't really realized what that meant until I was making my outline for this. And um, my sister that was the next older than me, was five years older than me, was, um, she only lived two and a half days. Uh, and my mom was told that she would never be able to bear live children again. In retrospect and the knowledge base that I have now, I think she actually died of meconium aspiration from the stories that were told, but um, I think that status in our family um, made me special in my grandpa's eyes, my parents' eyes, um, and the eyes of my oldest siblings. I, My oldest sibling was named Charlotte, and she was quite a bit older than my next oldest sibling, who was Jane. and. Um, Jane, Kathy, Jimmy, and Martha were all born relatively quickly. They were, Janie and Kathy are 13 months apart, and Kathy and Jimmy are 15 months apart, and Jimmy and Martha, I think, were 14 months apart. But then, as I said, Martha passed away, and I didn't come along for five years later. And then two and a half years after I was born, I have a younger sister, Margie, all of other than Martha. Um, all of us are still alive. My family unit consisted of my parents, my siblings, and my grandpa on my mom's side. He, his name was Charles Francis Hanley, and he was a great guy, one of my childhood heroes. We lived in, in his home that had not been his family homestead. Uh, it had been um, his wife's home. She grew up there. Her father built the house, and she grew up there, my mom grew up there, I grew up there, and several of my nieces and nephews actually grew up there. They, um, my grandma, Hanley, died when she, in 1945, so 10 years before I was born, so I never had the opportunity to meet her or know her in any way. That was, um, that was my, our family dynamics as I was a child growing up. So when I was a kid, we um, had things that we did all the time. One of, one of my great childhood memories were our Christmas trees. We had a big house with big rooms with tall ceilings, and our Christmas trees always touched the ceiling. And they were put in a in a bay in the living room, there were, there were some bay windows in the living room, and the ceilings were 11 and a half feet tall, and it was always a big family production, and everyone would participate in decorating the tree. My dad always had to um, tie the top of the tree to nails on the top of the of the woodwork that were, were on the sides, and the nails that were up there, they were 16 penny large nails, that, um, that were there and they stayed there year round. And when we were small children, he always told us 
that they were there because they were Santa's elves and they are what kept track of our behavior throughout the year so they would know if we were good or if we were bad. But our Christmas trees were um, always huge and always decorated and it was always a family event where we listened to Christmas music and sang songs and it was tons of fun. Years later, um, there was a year when my dad got sick and was not able to get the Christmas tree and my older siblings had all pretty much left home. I was I had a driver's license so I was at least 16 and my younger sister and I decided that we were going to go and get the Christmas tree and put up the Christmas tree and we didn't really understand the dynamics of the thing but we knew that we always got a big tree so we went to a Christmas tree farm and we went around and we picked out a tree for the man to cut down and the man said, are you sure this is the tree you want? And we were both, yes, we, this is the tree we want. We, it, we always have big, big trees and we want this tree. So he kept, he kept repeating that and asking us that, but he, he, got a tra he cut the tree down, he got a tractor, he pulled it out to the car, he secured it to the top of the car with twine and we drove it home and between the two of us um, and some friends we got the car the tree off of the car and went to take it in the house and we couldn't get it through the door we went in and we told daddy that we had gotten the christmas tree but we would need his help getting it in because it was so big we couldn't get in and he came out and he just looked at it and he started laughing hilariously because this tree was like 23 feet tall it was it was the biggest tree ever, and we had no concept of that. Um, and what he ended up doing was he cut the tree in half and trimmed some branches, and then we got the tree in, and it was the biggest, most beautiful Christmas tree we ever had. So that was one of um, my childhood memories. When we were kids, we used to spend um, a week or two every summer at a state park in Spencer, Indiana, where we still sometimes take our, our children and our grandchildren to this park for family week-long family reunions. But the name of the place was McCormick's Creek, and it was some of my great childhood memories are from there where we had we had freedom, we could run and we could play and we could walk on hikes and we could um, we went swimming. They had a huge swimming pool there, which actually one of my most traumatic events in my childhood occurred at this swimming pool. It was um, it was dinner time, and my mom had told me uh, um, to go to the pool and tell my older siblings that it was time to come in for dinner. And so I went over to the pool, and I, w I went in, and um, I was standing underneath the lifeguard's chair, and Janie, Kathy, and Jimmy were on diving boards. They used to do that. They used to try and do this synchronized diving thing that never actually was synchronized, but they always tried. There were two um, three-meter board, two, no, the lower boards, and then like the really high board one would be there, and they would try and, and time the dives so that the person who was on the middle board that was highest would go first and then as they got in the right position they would try the other two on the sideboards would try and dive in and that's where they were at this time when I went in to call them uh, back to our campsite for dinner so I went and I was standing there and I was yelling for them and they waved to me and they acknowledged that I was there so they knew that I was there and I was standing there and a, and a boy that was probably 11 or 12 years old, I was like five, came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm calling my brothers, my brother and sisters to come back for dinner. And he goes, can you swim? And I said, no. And he said, you do, I don't believe you. And he pushed me in. Now the water where I was, was a 13 foot deep end of the pool. And I could not swim. And I was, I was floundering in the water and almost drowned and it was it was a traumatic traumatic experience for me and I was right underneath the lifeguard's chair so the lifeguard could not see me and as Jimmy saw this happen he dove off the board and he came over 
and he saved me and pulled me out of the water. And at that point in time, until then, I had no fear of water. But at that point in time, I, I was deathly afraid of water and swimming from that point on well, well into my adult life. I think my kids never understood why it was always their dad that took them swimming, even though, though he had a great love of swimming. They never understood why I really never participated. And it was because of this fear of water that occurred at McCormick's Creek. The other um, things, the campsites at McCormick's Creek were always um, very primitive, which was very unlike my mom because my mom was a real city girl. She, was, she wasn't a farmer. She wasn't a country girl. She was a city girl. She was well-educated. And it was so strange to think of her going to this place where we, all the cooking was done outside and the refrigerator was actually an ice box outside um, where we kept our food. And inside we had, um, there were four or five sets of bunk beds that we slept in in a one room cabin and then all other activities occurred outside. But I loved marshmallow roasts over the fire. I loved, um, just the freedom of playing and swinging and running around and just having a great time. And that was an every year event at McCormick's Creek State Park in Spencer, Indiana, where I believe if my children were to do this, they too would have positive memories of that. So, as I said earlier, we lived with my grandpa Hanley and my grandpa Hanley worked at City Hall. He was actually the first probably air pollution control person in the state of Indiana. He was the smoke abatement commissioner for Vigo County where we grew up. And it was his job to make sure that factories didn't put off too much smoke and pollution into the air. But one of the great things that I remember from my childhood is that every Friday, Grandpa would come home and he would give us uh, a pack of Juicy Fruit Gum, not for us to share, but we would each and every one of us get a pack of Juicy Fruit Gum. It was the sweetest, most delectable, delicious thing. And I would bite my pieces in half and chew them so that I would try and make this five piece pack of gum last until the next week when I knew that I would get another one. And it, <clears throat> It doesn't seem like a lot in this day and age, but it was it was a wonderful, delightful treat that let us know that he thought that we were very, very special. And I looked forward every Friday evening when Grandpa would come home to uh, chewing juicy fruit gum. So when I was six years old, um, my little sister Margie and I we're out in the backyard in our garage playing in grandpa's car. And you have to realize that this was like in 1961, 62. He had um, a Pontiac and it was yellow with red interior and it was his pride and joy. And we used to love when he would take us for rides in that car. And we liked to just sit in it and pretend that we were driving. Well, the car, in our backyard, there um, we had a, a garage, and our neighbors, Susie and Jean Bronert, also had a garage. And they, the garages were level, but the driveways, as they came out, were on a slant. So one day, um, Margie and I were sitting in Grandpa's car, just, just playing, just sitting there pretending that we were driving like little kids can do. Um, and cars then did not have the safety measures that they have now. So I was playing and I, the, it, had, it was on the column, the, the gear shift was on the column and I moved the gear shift and the car started rolling forward. And it was like, we were panicking. We were in this car and we were just screaming because the car was going forward. It wasn't started or anything. I didn't know the difference between the brake and I didn't know how to stop it. I didn't know how to, how to make it go, how to stop it from going. It was just a crazy, crazy panicking moment in the age of a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And the car rolled down our driveway across the little bits of area between us uh, and up right through 
Susie and Jean Bronnert's Garage Door. And um, that was the single one and only time that my grandpa ever yelled at me. Um, and we were not allowed to play in the car after that. It was a traumatic experience for both of us, I'm sure. So about the same time in the um, 1960s, uh, actually a little bit later, 1964, because this went, it was when bands, rock bands, five piece boy bands, um, although they weren't called that, were coming into popularity. It was shortly before the Beatles became popular. Um, my sisters, my two older sisters, Janie and Kathy, um, had boyfriends that were in bands. They played electric guitars and they had, you know, they would have a drummer and a bass guitarist and two other guitarists and somebody would do vocals and some people would do backups, but they were mainly five piece boy bands. And in our house, in the same um, bay windows where we put our Christmas tree at Christmas time, these bands would set up on Fridays and Saturday nights. And we had, our carpet wasn't wall to wall carpet, it was, um, it was like a brocade carpet that was very well worn, if I remember correctly. And we would roll up those carpets. We, we would move all the furniture to the, to the sides of the room. We would get the carpets and we would roll them up and then we'd take them and we would move them into another room. And we would have these hardwood floors that were slippery and great for dancing in socks. And we would have Friday and Saturday night dances all the time. I remember this going on probably for two or three years from before the times of the Beatles until the Beatles uh, became popular. And um, one of the things that was said the night that we saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show was that, <clears throat> um, was, was that the Beatles were like the Nomads, which was one of the groups that my sister Janie's boyfriend Rex played in. And um, it, was, it was very fun. We would do twist, I always won won twisting con con uh, contests. We, um, they would jitterbug, they would just do all kinds of dancing and all, everybody from the whole neighborhood would come in, lots of people would come and it would be just great Friday and Saturday night, clean fun. My mom would make popcorn and, and we would have pizza and um, we would drink Orange Crush and Grape Crush and RC Cola. Uh, it was, it was just lots of fun, and it seemed to me like the parties would go late, late, late into the night, and I'm sure that I was always in bed by 11 o'clock, but it was it was great, great fun. And one of my big remembrances of this was a friend of, of my sister's. His name was Jackie Bly, and we called him Uncle Jake. He was um, a red-headed Irishman, and he liked me, and I would, I would stand on his shoulders, and we would dance, and it was... It was just lots of fun. When I was a small child, my dad was a construction worker and he was a union employee. He worked for the Sheet Metal Workers Local Number 7 that um, found him employment on a regular basis. And the problem was he frequently would work far away. He loved his family and was a great dad, but sometimes he would work in places that were 80, 90, or frequently Evansville, which was like 110 miles away from, from our hometown of Terre Haute. And he would, um, but he would drive it every day. And he would, he would get up early in the morning and he would go and drive to work and then he would drive home. And in retrospect, he must have never gotten more than like four hours of sleep a night. It was, it was kind of crazy. Um, but one of the things that I did for my dad when he was working in these places and having these long, long days, it was my great enjoyment to get up early in the morning and I would fix him his breakfast and pack him his lunch. And that would be our bonding time where we would just talk about things. We would talk about his honeybees because he was a beekeeper and he loved the bees. We would talk about the garden that he had down at my Aunt Marcella and Uncle Dick's house because he always had a huge, huge garden. 
we would talk about how I was doing in school. We would talk about um, how things were in the neighborhood and if we've had new neighbors move in or new neighbors move out or if one of the neighbors was unemployed, how their family was doing and how their children were behaving if they were acting out or um, different things like that. But it was one of my my great, great memories um, as a kid of probably like 11, 12, young teen, 13 years old possibly, I was getting up at 3.30 in the morning and fixing my dad's breakfast and packing up his lunch and making sure that um, in his lunch, his I always put butter on his bread so that the mayonnaise or the mustard didn't soak into his bread so that he would not have a soggy sandwich when it came lunchtime for him. And that was, um, that was one of my great memories of my dad, so. The Christmas, or a week or so before Christmas, when I was 13 years old, my grandpa Hanley fell and broke his hip and he went into the hospital. And he stayed there um, until he passed away on December 29th of 1968. And I remember um, the day really well. Um, it was nighttime and I was sleeping and I heard um, my Uncle John come in to the house downstairs and Margie and I were laying there and we looked at each other. It was dark, we were in bed and we heard him talking and I said, I think Grandpa died. And she said, I think he did too. And then the next day when we woke up, my mom told us that Grandpa had passed away. And that was a, a great heartbreak for us because we had um, lots of memories of Grandpa. I'm gonna regress here a bit from this. One of my great memories of my grandpa was sitting in his room with him. He had this old gray, um, <laughs> old gray radio that he would listen to all the time. And he had a pink brocade chair, rocking chair, recliner actually. Um, and he smoked cigars. To this day, I love the smell of cigars. When Dave and I go to Disney World and we're at Downtown Disney, that's not called Downtown Disney anymore. Um, and we walk by the, I think it's De Sosa's or De Soto's cigar factory. I just want a uh, cigar store. I want to stand outside and just whiff in and smell the cigars because I love the smell of cigars. And that's because my grandpa smoked cigars. So <clears throat> anyway, I used to sit with him on his lap in this pink brocade chair and he would smoke cigars and we would listen on the radio to rodeos. To rodeos. We lived in a city in Indiana and on this gray radio, we would just sit there and we would listen to rodeos. Um, and they would talk about the bunking broncos and they would describe um, they would describe the, these animals and they would, then there would be like the, the bareback, the bareback horseback riding thing and calf roping and all the different things that they did, um, did in rodeos. And I didn't think there was anything strange about it at the time at all. It was just a time where I just sat on my grandpa's lap with his arms wrapped around me. He was smoking cigars and I was just whiffing it in and lots of times I would fall asleep and I would wake up the next morning in my bed nice and warm. But it was, um, it was a great, great memory of my grandpa Hanley. So anyway, so he also was a practical joker. And shortly after he died, probably a month or so, um, let me regress again. When, when he would wake up in the morning, he would come to the top of the st of our stairs in our very large house, and he would say, yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, and we would all know that that meant Grandpa was up, and one of us would go out, and we would make sure that his breakfast was being prepared by someone, that there was hot coffee for him to have, and that the table was set, and he always had three strips of bacon, two eggs over easy, a cup of orange juice, and a cup of coffee. Um, 
and that was and a piece of toast. That was his breakfast all the time. So um, about a month after Grandpa died, we were sitting down for dinner, and it was my sister Kathy, my sister Margie, and my mom and dad. And we sat down, and at the exact same time, Kathy, Margie, and I all stood up, and my dad looked at, looked at us and said, sit down. And we're like, we all said, Grandpa just called. And then we looked at each other because we all knew that Grandpa had passed away. So me, being the kind of kid that I am, I didn't believe that he wasn't up there calling for us. So I ran up and I went upstairs and I looked around and I didn't see him anywhere. But I think it was him just playing a practical joke on us um, because he knew that we missed him and he wanted us to know that he missed us just as much. So growing up in the Midwest, where um, the summer weather is quite erratic, to say the least, um, it was not uncommon when the weather would be tumultuous for my dad to stand in our bathtub in the upstairs bathroom, and there was a window over, over the tub. It was one of those big old clawfoot cast iron tubs, and there was a window there and when the, and it faced the southwest area, and my dad would stand in that bathtub for a long time, and he too smoked cigars. He'd be smoking a cigar, and he would just watch the sky. His big fear in life was of tornadoes, and um, the story that goes back to his childhood is the story that wiped out the family farm, where my brother Jimmy and his wife Bonnie lived for a while. They still own that property and they farm it, but but they live in a different house now, not where, not on that specific farmland. But so my dad's family were farmers. They were country folk. They were simple, um, but they were they were farmers. And the story goes that when um, when he was young. He was on the school bus, which wasn't actually a school bus. It was a horse-drawn wagon. And um, they were being taken home from school. And it was my dad and two or, th I think, probably three of his little sisters. I think my Aunt Bertie, who was the youngest, probably wasn't in school yet. And maybe Aunt Vera wasn't either. But I'm sure that my um, Aunt Dean, whose name was Geraldine, and my um, aunt Marcella were both with him. It was at least the three, at least the three of them. And as they pulled up to to the farm, my dad and mom, grandma. Okay, so my grandpa Slusser and my grandma Slusser ran out and grabbed the kids and said, "We need to get in the root cellar. There is a tornado coming." And my uh, grandma took the children and ran into the ran into the root cellar where it was the only safe place to be and my grandpa said to the to the horse drawn school bus driver we need to get your horses and everything in the barn and then we'll go down to the to the cellar too so they were in the process of doing that and the the bus driver said to my grandpa said you go down with your family i'll finish this up and i'll be down in just a minute so as my grandpa shut the um, the root cellar door and locked it to protect it from the horrible winds the tornado struck and um, they were down there my dad said that it seemed like they were down there for hours as the wind just twisted and whirled but as we know tornadoes don't usually last that long in one spot so when they came up and they looked everything on their farm was gone the only thing left standing was a cow and she was standing there and she had a four inch by four inch fence post that was run straight through her. They never, um, they knew that the bus driver had been in the, in the barn and so they went into the barn to find him and the barn had collapsed, the horses had been knocked over and killed, they, but they could hear the bus driver uh, whimpering and my grandpa single-handedly went into the barn and uh, lifted a 12 inch by 12 inch 
solid oak uh, beam that had fallen on the bus driver, lifted it up and moved it over and got him out. And he did have broken legs, but he did live from the, from the event. But uh, my grandpa was the hero of the day. But since that moment in time, my dad was always fearful of tornadoes. And it didn't matter where we were, how old we were, whatever was happening, if there were tornado warnings anywhere, my dad would always call us, ask us how we were, if we were safe, to make sure. And on, I can't tell you how many nights we spent in our basements on uh, mattresses that were a against the walls of the of the basement and on the floor with our blankets and pillows and lanterns and um, anything else that we had down there, bottles of water, you know, big jugs of water. Um, we, anytime there was the threat of a tornado, we always spent it in the southwest corner of our basement at 616 North 14th Street, Terre Haute, Indiana. So my mom's family was very Irish. Um, her maiden name was Hanley. Um, her grand, her mother's maiden name was O'Loughlin. Um, the the grandmothers or the great grandmothers on other sides were Kane and Kelly. Um, so we were Irish on my mom's side from way back. Um, in the 1860s, there was a um, an event, my, I believe it was my grandmother's great uncle, whose name was Michael O'Loughlin. Michael O'Loughlin died in prison. I'm not sure what the year was, but he died in prison of malaria. Like so many others of the, um, I believe it were eight people that were found guilty in the conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Michael O'Loughlin had a very small part of it, and family lore says that he really didn't understand what the plan was. He was outside the Ford Theater, um, or theater, and was asked by a gentleman to hold his horse while he went inside to attend to some business. And he was just holding the horse when John Wilkes Booth came out and uh, jumped on the horse and rode off. And uh, it, he actually had to assist him back on the horse because he had broken his leg, I think is what the story was. And um, uh, he rode off. But uh, so great, great uncle or great, great second cousin, whatever, Michael O'Loughlin, who died in prison of malaria because he was one of the conspirators found guilty in assisting John Wilkes Booth in assassinating Abraham Lincoln. And that was, um, that was his claim to fame, I guess. Um, and he was one of the seven or eight people that were found guilty. So my mom was um, the only girl in a family. She had four brothers. I think four brothers, yeah. Um, and the youngest one of them um, was named Joseph William, Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe was, was very tall and very muscular and very athletic. Um, my mom used to tell the story, when, when, he, was, when he was young, um, like in his uh, late 30s, early 40s possibly, he, um, was diagnosed with a brain disorder that they really couldn't figure out what it was. And the thing people need to realize is that technology then is not like it is today. So they knew that he had, he was forgetting things, he was having chronic headaches, he was developing tremors, um, he was just developing a brain problem. And, um, what they attributed it to was the fact that Uncle Joe, back in the day, was a football player when they didn't have safe football helmets. And he was in, my mom tells the story, of when he was playing in a game and his helmet got knocked off. And um, I guess rules were different. So 
he played a couple of plays without a football helmet at all and was knocked unconscious. And um, after that, he started having really strange dreams and doing bizarre things in the middle of the night. My mom related the story to me on several occasions of when she would be asleep and um, she would be waking up because Uncle Joe would be throwing her bed from side to side in the room. And then when he would wake up, he would think that he was in a football game and that throwing the bed were actually, he was throwing other, um, other players uh, from here to there. And that was, um, it's kind of a trivial little story, but it's a little bit of family history and things that we, um, that we hear. And Uncle Joe actually died um, a relatively young death. Uh, he, he had a stroke, but by then he had been diagnosed with full-blown Parkinson's and, um, and they tr attributed all of that to the unsafe practices of playing football in the 1930s or whenever it was. When I was um, young, we had a family that lived across the street from us, and their name was Ford. And they had several children, like 12 kids, I think. And they all lived in this one house. And they were, they were less fortunate than we were. We were fortunate enough that my mom worked. She was a teacher. My dad was a construction worker. He worked. Um, grandpa worked, it was, we were just, we were a normal middle class family, lived in your basic city neighborhood where people all knew each other and the kids played with kids and we were all friends and um, the old, our house that we lived in was the only house within like a six block radius that was not owned by the Moorhead sisters, who were these two elderly school um, teachers that neither of them had ever gotten married, and they owned um, all of this property. And the Fords lived in one of their houses. And like I said, they had 12 children, and some of those children were married, and they had children. And I, um, we used to, when my, we used to give them all of our pop bottles um, so that they would have money to purchase milk for babies. We would always save those things. Um, we would, when my mom got groceries, she would sometimes send us with a box of groceries over to them with bread or, or whatever, just something to help the family out. Um, but they, um, the parents of, of the Moorheads were Bud, who was kind of, the town drunk, literally, the town drunk. Um, and he never worked that, that I knew of in my life. He never worked and he was a mean old cuss. He, they had these big, huge oak trees in their yard, three big, huge oak trees. And when, when fall came and we would be like raking our front yard, he wouldn't let the boys use rakes. He used to make them go out and pick the leaves up by hand. Um, from these huge oak trees, and it was a never-ending task for these boys. Um, I remember one summer night, uh, Mrs. Ford came home from work, and Mrs. Fo Mr. Ford was there, and he apparently was drunk because she picked him up by his belts and the co his shirt collar and threw him outside, and he was laying crying on the um, on the sidewalk by the curb. And he was just laying there crying. And after this had gone on for a while, my dad went over to look to see if he was okay, but he had broken his hip. So that was, um, yeah, that was one of the memories. But one of the things we used to do is on, uh, on Wednesdays, we used to get uh, a dollar for uh, an allowance that we always got from my grandpa, my little sister and I did. And a lot of my stories are about when my little sister and I did things and and because my older siblings were so much older than we were. So it was, um, yeah, for a lot of my memory, 
they they weren't there. They had gone off to college or they had gone, um, gotten married and gone and done things, moved away for whatever purpose. So anyway, so we used to go to the little corner market, Gallagher's, <clears throat> and um, we would buy candy. And so they had a penny candy uh, counter and we would do that and we would um, we would always share our stuff with the Ford kids because they had they had kids our age and we would um, we would do we would just share everything that we had that was a special treat with them well, so one day um, we went to Catholic school and the thing at the Catholic school was you had to wore, wear navy blue or gray skirts white blouses and navy grew navy blue or gray knee high socks that matched your skirt so we each had one navy blue and one gray skirt with socks to match and five white blouses so that on sunday mo saturday mornings uh, the laundry would get done and we would have clean white blouses for the next week the fords each had one skirt one pair of socks and one white blouse um, so i remember one day specifically we were, I went out of the house and went across the street to the Fords to knock on the door to see if they were ready to walk two blocks to school. And um, they came out and they all had new white blouses and shirts. And I'm like, wow. And they're like, our mom went shopping and bought us new, um, my, our, our mom went and bought us, bought us new clothes. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's nice. It's nice to have a white, a white shirt and blouse. And I was, I was literally happy for her. So we left and we went to school and that was, you know, that was it for the day. It wasn't any big deal. The next day, um, she said to me, let's go to Gallagher's after school. And I said, I can't go to Gallagher's after school. It's not Wednesday. I don't have any money. And she said, I've got money. And I'm like, you do? And she said, yeah. And she had a $10 bill, a $10 bill. And it was like, what? So after school, she took our entire class to Gallagher's and we bought candy and ice cream and um, RC colas and just all kinds of stuff that the whole class did. And Jackie paid for it all with her $10 bill. And it was just, it was just so strange for them, for her to suddenly have money. But I was a kid and I didn't think anything more of it. Well then, as the weeks went on, things started happening like Mr. Ford got a car and then um, one of the Ford boys got an electric guitar. And then um, the girl that was my age came over and she goes, look what my mom gave me. And she had a doll and it had a red velvet coat on and it had blonde hair that was curly and it had, it had boots, uh, fur boots and stockings. And it was just an absolutely gorgeous doll. And I wanted that doll. I, I truly, I just wanted that doll. Um, at this point in my life, I look at that and I think that was probably the first thing that belonged to someone else that I actually coveted. Um, and I did not understand it at all. So then as times, uh, as time rolled on over a period of, it seemed like forever to me, it may have been just a few weeks, but they got all new furniture, Anybody that was old enough to drive got a car. Anyone that wasn't got 10-speed bicycles. They, um, everything in that household was changing. And my, and my mom said, well, we don't need to give them our pop bottles anymore, or milk bottles. So uh, as the story unveiled what had happened, Mr. Ford, who was the town drunk, um, um, that used to go from bar to bar all the time, mooching drinks, people would buy him drinks and he would just come home drunk. Um, went to a place called the Merry-Go-Round Tavern, which was, we lived on 14th Street and the Merry-Go-Round Tavern was on 13th and a half, a block south of where we lived. Um, so um, uh, Mr. Ford went in there one day and he was intoxicated and asked the, uh, uh, the bartender, if he ever considered selling the place, and the bartender said, yep, if somebody had $15,000, I'd sell it right now. And Mr. Ford counted $15,000 out of his pocket. And the bartender looked at him and knew 
that something was wrong and it wasn't um, it, it wasn't right. So he called the police and the police started investigating. And I do remember the day that men in trin black trench coats came to our house to talk to my dad. Um, but what had happened was Mrs. Ford and um, one of the daughters, in exchange for rent and upkeep on this massive house that they lived in with all of these people, they were housekeepers and cooks and caregivers to the Moorhead sisters. And the Moorhead sisters had one brother, his name was John, and he lived in California and had recently passed away. And John had a son named John who had not come to visit the Moorhead sisters since infancy, and he was coming to visit. So the sisters asked Mrs. Ford and her daughter if they would clean out Brother John's room that had been closed up for years. No one had needed to, live, to be in there, no one had visited, John had never come home, it was just there and it was stuffy and they were to air out the mattresses and uh, clean all the bedding and to clean the rooms so that when, when nephew John came, he could sleep in his dad's room. So they, um, as they were cleaning this room, they went to open the closet and the closet was nailed shut. And they thought that was very strange. And so they asked the Warren sisters, and they're like, no, we don't know what's in there, just open it up. So they opened it up and they found that it was full of coffee cans that were stuffed with money. Um, story, story has it that back in the day, the Moorhead's dad was quite the moonshiner and sold bootleg whiskey and made lots of money in it. Um, and uh, a lot of this money apparently was stuffed in coffee cans and put in this closet that was full. And now this wasn't a little closet. The, the closets in these houses were probably four feet wide, four feet deep, and eight feet high. And it was this closet was full of money, and the, Mrs. Ford took it all. And when the whole thing came to court, and the or it didn't, didn't even actually go to court because when the police investigated and realized their investigation and what had happened and everything, they went to the Moorheads and told them what had happened, and their response was, "They're really good people and they work really hard. They can have it. We didn't even know it was there." Isn't that a great story? That was um, that was a long time ago, but it's one of one of the one of my great stories from childhood, and just a story of how some people are really good and things get lost and they don't know that they're there. And when they were found by people who just took it, some people are good enough to just say, you're good people, you work hard, you deserve it. I have been married twice. I, uh, my first husband, Jerry Noonan, is the father of my three kids. My second husband, Dave Trussell, is my current husband and he has three children. Um, we don't have any children between us, but we do consider our children our children, okay? So um, I met Jerry a long time ago. I was um, 18 and I was hanging out with the friends and we went to a place called the Huddle Restaurant and uh, the first, I had a friend who had a friend that was dating this guy, and his name was Jeff Noonan. And Jeff Noonan had two brothers that were in town, and they um, were coming to meet us for us all to go out. It was, the, this date was, I believe, it was April 5th of 1973. I'm pretty sure that was the date. Um, I should have still been in high school, but I hated school so much. Um, I only went half a year, and so I was going to Indiana State University. But these three guys came down, down the stairs, and I looked up at one of them, and he had shoulder-length, blonde, wavy hair, and these big, brilliant blue eyes. And it was like, oh, well, if that's not her Jeff, I might have to meet this guy. So, um, and his name was Jerry Noonan, and we met that night. And after that, he took the brother Jeff back to New York and went on to, to Maine. And we continued a correspondence. And um, I went to see him. No, he, he came to see me on the 4th of July. And 
then I came up to Jamestown to visit him. I'm not really sure. I'm vague on those details. Um, I went up to Maine to see him for Thanksgiving. He came out to see me for Christmas, asked me to marry him. Um, life goes on. We got married June 29th of 1974. We uh, spent a year, spent the summer in Terre Haute, went to Maine, um, spent a little over a year there while he got his master's degree. Um, then we came here to Jamestown, uh, and I have been here ever since. Um, we had three children, Jennifer Lynn, who was born April 7th of 1977, Brandy Lee, who was born December 28th of 1979, and James Richard, who was born um, April 23rd of 1981. Um, Jerry was a teacher and a football coach, which was in his genes because that's what his dad did, that's what his brother Jeff did, or Jay did. Um, it, it was just, it was just something that his, he came by that talent and ability rightly. Um, we were married for quite a while, but grew apart, um, and we were divorced in, I'm not really sure, 1992. Uh, I know it was after 91 because it was after I got out of uh, nursing school and, um, Anyway, so I, th I think it was 1992. We went through some real troubles there. He, um, yeah, he had health issues. Both of my parents passed away in the interim. Um, things were just kind of kind of crazy. Um, and we, we just opted to part ways for our mutual agreement. Um, at that point in time, I was a registered nurse and I was working at Westfield Hospital. Um, and the girls who worked on the floor used to talk about this guy in a, a PA in the emergency room named Dave Trussell. Um, and what a great guy he was, that he was just so kind and he was nice and he was compassionate and everything. And I'm like, why don't I know this guy? So, um, uh, fast forward a couple of years, um, I actually met Dave Trussell when I got transferred to the emergency room from the med surge floor, and I thought he's a really nice guy, and he was divorced, and he had three kids, and he we had a lot in common. But, um, uh, I had to ask him out three times before he would go. Three times I had to ask him out. The first time, he said that he had to go take his boards because as a PA he has to do his boards every six years and he had to go retake those boards. Um, then the second time um, I, I asked him, I can't even remember what I asked him to go to, but he um, went to, oh, he said that he couldn't because he had to go pick up his kids and um, that was like a three hour trip one way and he would have his children for the weekend and then he would have to take them home so he wasn't able to go. So the third time I figured out um, I was really going to make it at a time where he could not say no and that if he did say no I knew that this just wasn't meant to be. So um, we both worked on a per diem occasional as needed basis at WCA Hospital um, in the emergency room there. We were full-time employees at Westfield Hospital but as a per diem, we both worked at WCA. So I looked up on the on the um, uh, schedule and found a night that he was working the afternoon shift and getting off at 7 p.m. Uh, it was during the week, so I knew he wouldn't have to worry about going to get his children or going off to do something, and that and he would have worked all day, so he would have had nothing to do. So um, I saw him at work and I said. And I and I I didn't really want it to seem like I wanted to go out with him. I just kind of wanted to get to know him better because we it seemed to me like we had a lot of similarities. So um, I had told him that I had received a gift certificate to a local restaurant, and my kids didn't want to go there, and they really didn't want to go there. Um, but it was a sizable gift certificate, and I didn't really have anybody to share it with. So I asked him if he 
wanted to go there for dinner on this Wednesday night when I knew he got out at seven o'clock, but I didn't tell him I knew that he got out at seven o'clock. So I um, went, uh, he said, well, I work that night. And I said, well, what time do you get off? And he goes, well, I'm supposed to get off at seven. And I said, well, I said, I don't mind eating late. I said, why don't you just call me when you're done and we'll just go have dinner together. So he called me when he was done and we went, we met at this place and it was, it was terrible food. We had good service because our server actually was a friend of James' mom, um, Rue Eggleston's mom, Julie, was our waitress. And um, we had great service, but I can't even remember what we ate, but the food was terrible. And I was really embarrassed that I would take him to such a place. So as we left and he walked me out to my car, uh, on the front seat of my car was a book. And the name of the book is Everyone Poops. And he looked at it and he goes, oh, he goes, so do you have somebody in diapers? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, my kids are way older than that. And he goes, so this is family reading material? And I said, no. I said, my daughter is a nanny, a, mother, a nanny slash mother's helper for some people and they have a small child and um, they're trying to get her potty trained. And so this is actually Jenny's book um, that she has for this little kid. So we started talking about books and things that um, that we both enjoyed. And he liked mysteries, which I don't. I'm more of a historical fiction kind of person. Um, but the movie, uh, The Client, I think, with Susan Sarandon, it's uh, about an Amish boy that witnesses a, um, a murder. That had just come out that week, and so we ended up going to the movie after we went to that, and then we did, we did, he took me back to my car and we continued to work together and we went on and um, we just became good fast friends and I met his kids and he met my kids and we took a couple of family vacations like to North Carolina, to the Outer Banks and we did things and um, the deal was if you marry me, you marry my kids and um, that's what it was, and then on uh, November 30th of 1996, we got married at the Hurlbut Chapel at Chautauqua Institution. Uh, it was kind of funny because I was Mormon. Dave had grown up in a in a Methodist household. His dad was a Methodist preacher and actually performed that wedding ceremony, but Dave was Baptist, so we were, it was quite, uh, yeah, quite, quite uh, a mixture of religious beliefs. So um, the Hurlbut Chapel was packed full and that began my life with him that has uh, gone forward and come to be, come, become a, hopefully an eternal relationship if I can keep my stuff together. So as I had grown up um, Catholic, my religious beliefs were firmly ingrained in me. I went to Catholic school. Um, we attended mass every day. Uh, I sang in the choir, so I had to go on Saturday as well as Sunday. And we always went to school before we went to, uh, um, we would go to school, say our prayer, walk next door to the church, attend mass, and then come back for our classes for the day. So I was always had a very strict, deep-rooted, religious belief in God um, and new bits of Jesus Christ dying for us and being born to the Virgin Mary. Um, so that was my religious belief. So in 1977, uh, the first weekend in April, we moved into our house that we, actually I still live in in Busti. And, um, that following Thursday morning at 1.38 in the morning, our first child was born. And um, it was a little girl. We named her Jennifer Lynn. And she was precious. And the first time I held her, completely overwhelmed me. Um, later that summer, um, life was going on. I was staying home and I was taking care of her. And Jerry taught school and life was good. And one August afternoon, I think it was August 3rd, it rained, rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. And late in the day, the sun came out and there was steam rising from the streets. And I went out 
um, to get the mail out of the mailbox. And I looked down the road and there were two guys walking down the road. They looked like drowned rats and they had black trench coats over, over their shoulder. And as they got closer to me, I realized that they were Mormon missionaries. I had periodically off and on um, come in contact with Mormon missionaries, but I didn't really know that much about them. So um, as they got close to me, I looked at them and I said, hey, and they said, hey, and I said, you guys Mormon? And they said, yeah, and I said, would you like some lemonade? And they said, yes, and so they came in and they had some lemonade, and I think I gave them a sandwich, actually, and they asked if they could come back later to, um, uh, uh, to talk with, um, with my husband when he got home from work. Uh, and I said, I said, sure. So they came back later that night um, uh, to, to meet with Jerry. And we uh, had the first discussion, they talked to us about taking a discussion. And back then they had flip charts and little film reels and stuff. Um, they, um, their names were Elder Twitchell and Elder Ken Ross. Um, later on in the scheme of things, Elder Twitchell got transferred and Elder Brown, Rick Brown was his name, um, came in and they were the first missionaries that taught us. The problem was that um, we were leaving, my mom was coming the next day. They asked if they could come back and visit with us. My mom was coming the next day and the following day we were going to Florida to visit my little sister who lived down in, in Hollywood, Florida. So. Um, they said, okay, and Jerry said, I'll call you when we get back. And I just thought, he's not gonna call them, no no way. So we um, we went, we drove down to Florida with my mom, we went on vacation, and I remember when we came back, uh, we were coming back from Florida, and it was August 16th, and the, rem and the day I, the reason I remember that, because it was the day that Elvis Presley died. And um, Elvis Presley and I have a deep, deep connection because he was 20 years, 20 years to the day older than me. So, um, so I always remember that. So when we got home, one of the first things Jerry said was, should I call those missionaries? And there was elders and I'm like, sure. So he called them and we went through, we took discussions and um, I didn't, I really did not think that religion made a difference. I figured a church is a church is a church and it made no difference to me. But Jerry, at that point in time, at that minuscule point in time in his life, he was firmly committed to joining the, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and so for his birthday on February 23rd of 1978, my gift to him was to be baptized. So um, that's when we got baptized and joined the church. Our, um, our membership was strong initially. We had great callings. It was, it was good, but like so many other parts of our lives, we just grew apart. He went inactive, I went inactive, but then I understood the significance of strong religion and upbringing children, so I would go back to church, but then something would be said and I would be offended, so I would uh, stop going to church. And so for years, for all of my kids' lives, my membership waxed and waned. I made great friends at church, great friends that I hold responsible partly for having my children grow into the wonderful people that they are. Um, my membership waxed and waned, but I was gradually, step by step, inch by inch, gaining a testimony um, of things like prayer and children's prayers and the positive effect that um, youth activities can have on children. There were so many different aspects to the gospel um, that like little bit, steps by step, step by step, I, um, I, was I was gaining a testimony. I had never been to the temple, had never, um, um, yeah, never thought that my kids would grow up to serve missions or, or that I was that kind of a mom, but I was willing to go and, and arrange for my kids to get rides and had good friends that actually would take them to seminary because my kids did go to early morning seminary. Um, just different aspects of the gospel that I wasn't fully committed to that 
um, there was enough commitment there to encourage my children to participate. So Dave and I got married in um, November of 1996. And in February of 1997, we received a Jenny, it re received a call from Jenny who had moved to Provo um, to go to school. Hmm. Anyway, um, she told me that she had met a, a young man, a return missionary that she was going to marry. And she wanted to let me know because she was getting married in the temple and she would really like me to be there. When she said that, I really didn't know what to say, but I knew that my oldest daughter was not going to get married without me being present. So I talked to Dave about it, and I went and I talked to our bishop and um, told him that I needed to be ready to go to the temple in August. So he told me, he said, well, you have to start paying tithing. You have to start regularly attending meetings. You, you have to go to the temple yourself. You have to do this, you, all the things that I needed to do. And I said, fine. I said, I can do them. So um, I, um, I told Dave what, um, what it was going to entail. And I think I actually went through maybe a temple prep course. Um, <clears throat> so... Dave actually um, had received a letter or a phone call from our bishop, who was Richie Thompson at the time, and uh, had to write a letter saying that it was all right with him for me to attend the temple to receive my endowments and the, um, the commitment that would be made there would be okay with him. Um, I... So I went forth, and Jenny and Darren got married on August 15th of 1997, and I'm not sure what day it was, probably the 12th. I lo loaded up my car with, um, with Brandy and James and Sarah, Dave's daughter, and um, we drove to Chicago, Illinois, where we met my good friend Sonny Warnick, who is one of the many people who I hope is one of my eternal friends and and was a great um, strength to my, throughout my children's growing up. And she was a pillar with a strong testimony of the gospel. So we met um, Sonny at the Chicago Temple. We left the kids in the cars outside to do whatever they did. We went in. I received my endowments. And I remember at one point thinking, what have I done? This is serious stuff. I am making covenants with God. And um, I almost got up and walked out, but it, I, I was so afraid to do that. But in my gut, as much as I was overwhelmed, I knew that it was right. So we went out, we finished up there, went in. I, we went out for lunch, we got in the car and we drove on to Utah. And on that day in August in the Bountiful Temple for Jenny and Darren, I was there uh, to witness their, their sealing. So um, that was a critical turning point in my life. My husband was not a member of the church. Not only was he not a member of the church, he was a Baptist. <laughs> um, so I, um, at that point began, and we had agreed when we got married, that religion would never become come between us. So I started going to church religiously. <laughs> um, I went to my church. Dave went to his church. Life went on. Things were um, things were good. Um, James went to serve a mission, um, and he when uh, when he went on his mission. Um, I knew that there would be great blessings to come from that mission. And one um, late in the mission, um, my friend Kennelly called me one day and asked me if I was coming for dinner. And I'm like, when? And she told me. And I'm like, for what? And she said, for Dave to take the second discussion. And I'm like, Dave's taking discussions? And she said, yes. And I'm like, okay. So 
So I went, and it was you know, like I fasted because I knew they'd ask him to commit to baptism, and I thought that would be a great thing, and da-da-da-da-da. And when they asked him, he said no. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I was, um, it was like a week later, so I don't know. I was, a, a few nights later, I was at work, and the phone rang, and it was Dave, and I, I took the call, and um, he asked me what I was doing the following Saturday, and I said, I'm working. And he said, well... Uh, I said, why, what do you need? And he said, I thought you might want to go to a baptism. And I'm like, who's getting baptized? And he said, I am. And I'm like, hold on. So I covered the phone and I said to my friend Mo, who was sitting next to me, I said, Mo, I said, you know how my son James is on a mission in Houston teaching people about Jesus Christ that don't know about him? And she said, yes. And I said, Dave is taking those same discussions with missionaries here and he wants to get baptized next Saturday. Would you work for me so that I can go? And she said, yes, without a doubt. So Mo worked for me. I went to Dave's baptism. And after his baptism, he was the f he was out of that font and dressed so quickly. He came back. He was the first one up to bear his testimony. And he has been a pillar since then. He, um, he has led me through tough times. Um, when, I, when my testimony wavers, he is there. He knows that we are eternal. We were sealed in the Provo Temple on um, on April 18th of 2004. Um, Jenny and James were both there, and they were both sealed to us also. Um, so even though our eternal family circle is not complete, we've got lots of members in it. All of Jenny's kids were born under the covenant, and all, um, all of James also. So we have an eternal family going on. I do want to talk about one specific member of the family that has been a positive influence in my life, even though for the very, very brief time that he was here, is Jenny's second born child, Taylor. The day that I found out Taylor had passed away, uh, was our state conference, and I went to state conference, and um, our speaker there was Elder Holland, and I was, it was just a rough morning for me, because Jenny had called me and said that they, she didn't feel right, and that she didn't feel Taylor move, and um, she, they went to the hospital, and they couldn't find a heartbeat, and she, she was way pregnant. Um, I'm not really sure what his due date was, but she she was very, very pregnant, due like within a month. So it was very distressing to know that she was going to have this baby that um, that we would have no life with. But as Elder Holland was speaking, he looked into the congregation and he said that he knows that there are people there that are having a really rough day and he wanted us to know that the Lord loves broken hearts that just like a bone, when a heart is broken, it heals and it's even stronger in that spot and it will never break in that spot again. And and I knew that my heart was broken because this was something I had never gone through. It was terrible as a grandmother. I cannot imagine what it was like as a mother and there was nothing I could say or do, no words of comfort, nothing that could help my daughter my firstborn daughter through it. So uh, the next day I got on a plane and I have been forever eternally grateful for Elder Holland's words to me on that day in October of 2001 that, um, that the Lord loves broken hearts that are healed and, and it is through him that my heart has been healed because I know that it is through Jesus Christ that I will be able to see this precious little Taylor as a grown man in all his glory and know what, um, how he is and to know him and his personality and that he, um, that we are part of an eternal family. Our eternal round is there. I just want to say 
that I'm really thankful for the opportunity I have to be here in Provo this week um, to see Jenny uh, be sealed to John Dye um, and the family that they um, will will have with his children and her children, very similar to Dave's and mine. Um, I am thankful for um, the services of, I can't remember his name, Eric, Jared, I can't remember his name, anyway, who provides this service. And um, I think it's a great, great opportunity for people to pass on. And I hope that, um, that maybe a few years from now I can add to this and that I can talk about things like the first time I held my granddaughter Ray, how my heart just swelled, um, and all the other great, great things that are about to happen with our family. And um, this is my lifey up to now. <laughs>